Yeah. Welcome everyone to the Eugene City Council work session for February 15th. Welcome to everyone here and at home. Um, the first item we have up is uh, taking action on what we discussed oh. last time, right, which that. is a um, resolution. And uh, Councillor Zelenka, I think, is going to take the lead on that. Yes, Mayor, I'll, I'll put on the table. If it gets a second, I'll I'd like to speak to it. Okay. Uh, I move to adopt Resolution 5055, Resolution requesting that the United States Congress refer to the states an amendment to the U.S. Constitution declaring that corporations do not possess the constitutional rights of that constitutional rights that natural persons possess. Second. Moved and seconded. Go ahead. Um, to me, this issue, uh, which is around the Citizens United case, which the Supreme Court uh, uh, came out with in 2010, and this issue is really about the uh, what I believe is the excess of uh, of, of uh, independent, unlimited money coming into the into the uh, election process, and I think it's very bad for our democracy. Today, uh, uh, I handed this out. There's a on the CNN website. There was a, an editorial by uh, Fred Wertheimer is the president of Democracy 21. It's just a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization um, working on campaign finance reform. And he had some very good points, and he says it better than I could, so I'll just refer to this briefly. That in um, 1907 is when Congress banned corporate contributions to federal candidates in the wake of robber baron era scandals, and in 1947 it was formally applied to corporate expenditures and extended to cover labor union expenditures. And then in 74, uh, individual contributions were to federal candidates and political committees were uh, uh, instituted in the wake of the Watergate scandal. And then in 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in Citizen United declared corporate expenditure ban unconstitutional, which opened the door to the super PACs. And uh, as well, you know, the, the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C. Circuit on, in Speech Now case held that limits on individual contributions uh, made uh, that made independent expenditures were also unconstitutional. That's the circuit court, not the Supreme Court, so it's not the law of the land. So uh, in in essence, what Mr. Uh, Wertheimer is saying is that uh, these super PACs, which can raise unlimited contributions uh, from super rich people and corporations and labor unions to spend independently, in uh, which he says is, is a, uh, a fantasy. And uh, they did a study uh, recently, U.S. Public Interest Group, and has found that super PACs raised $181 million in the last two years. And roughly half of that money came from 200 super rich people. That 93% of it came from people who donated $10,000 or more. More than half of it came from just 37 people. So, uh, and and uh, he goes on to say that the super PACs are a game for millionaires and billionaires. And uh, and even President Obama has suggested that he, his uh, independent super PAC uh, be funded. So the independence to me is really uh, specious. And uh, he makes two very good points. One, and, and I support these two points, that, that the super PACs corrupt our political system on page three in two ways. First, super PACs allow relatively few super rich individuals and other wealthy interests to have greatly magnified and undue influence over the results of our elections. And second, super PACs allow the super rich and wealthy interests to buy influence over government decisions in the event the candidate wins. And the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United case that unleashed this is built entirely on the fiction that independent expenditures by corporations cannot have a corrupting influence on federal officials. And he goes on to say that that's a fantasy and not the reality, and I think that is, <coughs> is coming true. I think this, this uh, is corrupting our democracy, and I support uh, I encourage uh, my counselors to support this. Uh, just a note, process note. There's two in front of you. There's one that's a red line, one that's a, a clean version. Those are the ones that are on the table. Okay. Betty's in the queue. Yes, I wish to. I move to delete the words and unions from section two. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. You want to say anything to that, Betty? Yes, uh, unions are in no way comparable to corporations. Unions exist to help working people and for the rights of working people, and corporations exist to make a profit. So it's, it's not a comparable thing at all, and it's not 
it's not equal it's not comparable power either and I, according to what information I have so far uh, no other resolutions have included unions uh, George Foley well I can't support the uh, amendment because in the original um, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission it specifically addresses corporations unions and other special interest groups so if the amendment passes I won't be able to support the resolution based on that and my experience with unions is is it's mandatory contributions and then the union spends your money and um, to try to make your life better as well as contributing to the campaigns uh, you know corporations granted you invest as a stakeholder but if that corporation makes money you get a return of some monetary amount whereas unions don't get any monetary amount maybe you might second hand uh, as uh, you know see it in pay raises or benefits or whatever but uh, <clears throat> since it was originally addressed specifically addressed in the original in the Citizens United case uh, I, I cannot uh, support the amendment or the resolution without uh, the added wording Alan so I agree with what you said Betty uh, and 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 uh, I support unions and I, and I think they are com substantially different than corporations they're a group of individuals getting together as opposed to a, a business for profit uh, and in that sense they're substantially different than corporations and they also don't wield the same amount of power and the unions have been on the decline and and uh, and and, uh, and, and, the, and so they're not corporations which is why I think the Supreme Court said corporations and unions and Citizens United but this isn't about unions and corporations this is about campaign finance reform for me and it's about the undue influence of super uh, amounts of money going and corrupting our, our democracy and so in that sense it's about the large institutions whether they be corporations unions or special interest groups that are pumping in this money the reason I brought forth this article today was just to show you give you an example of, of how 37 people can contribute 90 million dollars in, into this and if there's no expectation for anything about that uh, I find that just extremely hard to believe I think that the uh, it's mostly focused on on the, the corporations and the and their and they're uh, that they are not citizens and and most importantly that money is uh, not speech and that um, uh, regulating political contributions and spending is not equivalent to limiting political speech so I think that's the underlying theme of this not the not the definition of uh, uh, corporations or not and finally I, I can't imagine any campaign finance reform legislation moving forward or a constitutional amendment that didn't limit everybody mm -hmm. um, the, uh, so it's not intended to be uh, an anti-union piece it's just the reality of it is is that unions and corporations spend an enormous amount on these things and that's what's um, I think affecting and corrupting our political campaign or our political elections especially at the federal level the super I think we haven't even seen the, the uh, full extent of this this is just starting this is the first real election since this decision came out and it's we're already being overrun by these uh, anonymous donors spending millions and millions of dollars for a very select few of people spending millions and millions of dollars trying to influence this um, and and I think that is really bad for our democracy Chris you're next uh, yeah, I would agree with um, everything that Alan said. And, and an additional piece for me, as I agree, unions and corporations are two different things, which is why they're referred separately. Um, but part of this also for me is, was the notion of um, whether or not a corporation or a union would be considered a natural person. Um, is a corporation an, like an individual or is a union like an individual? And from that standpoint, uh, neither one is an individual. And so I think um, keeping them together was in the spirit of what the original uh, law was. And I think we need to parallel that in terms of what we do so I I will not support the amendment and George Brown well I um, I think I will support the amendment because um, I, I can't in my mind equate corporations with unions uh, e corporations have often worked against the interests of unions um, it's been the whole history that's why we have unions without without the unions we wouldn't have the weekend we wouldn't have 
maternity leave. We wouldn't have sick leave. We wouldn't have the 40-hour work week or the five-day work week. We wouldn't have all these <laughs> other things. And, and they weren't just for union members. Everybody else benefited, too, because employers had to keep pace with what union the union laborers were getting for themselves. It was So everybody benefited from the works of unions. And um, they were opposed uh, often in you know, bloody, violent confrontations by corporations. And so I, I, I will support Betty's motion. Then. So I just wanted to put into the mix that the folks who asked for this to be moved forward, uh, we the local We the People group uh, sent a communication and their comment was uh, that they oppose adding unions to the language in Section 8 and Section 2. However, uh, this is a quote from them, we understand and appreciate the reasons some member of council may want to include it and do not think the inclusion of the language should prevent the resolution from moving forward. If the language on unions is added, they believe it belongs in Section 2, not Section H. To the best of our knowledge, this is a quote from them, Having examined resolutions from other jurisdictions calling for an amendment to the U.S. Constitution ending corporate right, none have included unions in their language. Eugene should not be the first. We will make our opposition to including unions in the language public when asked. Unions fundamentally represent the interests of working people related to wages, benefits, and working conditions, and as such, their advocacy is in the public interest. This differs fundamentally from the obligations of corporations whose fiduciary obligation requires management to maximize profits in the interest of private shareholders. So that's just it, what they set for you to consider. Okay, so I think we're ready to vote on um, Betty's motion. All those in favor? Two in favor, in opposition. Uh, five in opposition. It, do, it does. It goes down. So now we are back to the <coughs> main um, motion. Alan, I did uh, make an error in drafting um, this. That um, in section one on the second page, um, Glenn had pointed out, and, and I, I missed it when I was redrafting it in red line. That uh, section one should also say corporations, unions, and special interest groups. So, um, friendly amendment to add th that. To add correct what? that error. To what? Show me. So, section one, section one says corporations should not. It should say corporations, unions, and special interest groups should not. Okay. Yeah. And, that, and your second is. Uh, I'll accept that. You'll accept that as a friendly. Sure. Okay. It's just a drafting error. Okay. And other. George and Betty. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, Pat. Just a, a question. So are we voting on the red line version? They're the same. They Both versions are the same. One is okay. just minus the red line. All right. Yeah. As you can see clearly, uh, which I, was what added. What I did is I printed off at home the, the, the other two, and then that when they pass these out, I thought they were the same. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very they good. are the same. Very good. Okay. So, Betty? Well, I just want to say it's very difficult for me to vote for this when it doesn't make any sense to compare unions to put them together. Um, that's that's all. Okay, Pat. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> you know, my uh, my vote on this, my vote against this motion, is not an indictment of the motion itself. And it's not an indictment of the uh, spirit behind the motion. I don't particularly have an opinion that on the on the table about that. The, my vote against it is, uh, is based upon the fact that we are chartered as a city council to take care of the business of the city of Eugene. And I'm afraid that when we dilute our attention and dilute our staff time, our staff resources, and the council's resources to, um, to uh, events and occurrences that really we don't have a great deal of control over, nor are we chartered to have any control over it, it, uh, it makes me feel that we are uh, wasting a lot of, uh, lot of uh, the public's time, a lot of staff time, and a lot of valuable resources that could be spent elsewhere. So, you know, as the, the, the elected de decision-making body for the city of Eugene, we have to commit our limited resources and time to issues that we have a direct impact on and for purposes for which we are chartered. By choosing not to vote for this and had it come down to the normal motion process where the, where the uh, president makes the motion, the vice president seconds the motion, I would not, not have seconded the motion. Uh, by choosing not to do that, um, I'm not debating, once again, the merits of the resolution. I'm just saying that we, we've got to be vigilant about not setting a precedent for passing resolutions aimed at other governing bodies instead of focusing on the work that we have been elected to do and over which we have jurisdiction. 
passing re resolutions on federal issues don't s fill a single pothole locally. They don't put more police on the street. It doesn't help our homeless population. I encourage the people who have taken the time to gather signatures and are passionate about the issue and any other issues in involving other, the, in any other issues, including city councilors, to take your case directly to federal representatives who have the legal power to vote on such matters. Uh, once again, I'm not, uh, I'm not in favor of this, and I'm not discussing the merit of the resolution. I'm just discussing the process by which the city council addresses the business of the city of Eugene. Andrea. So um, <clears throat> I was just going to respond to Councilor Taylor's comments about unions. Um, I know locally our unions do some fabulous things, and I, I support them, and it's wholeheartedly. To me, this is about campaign. Um, dealing with campaign issues and I think that they do have an impact in some of the states if you look at what California did the the prison guard unions are the guys who or the women or the population that um, got Arnold Schwarzenegger into office and so they do have a lot of they do have a lot of push in some places and, and for me as far as resolutions go um, to this community I think that anytime our um, community brings us a resolution that does have merit and that that um, we feel compelled to bring to our peers, that is one of our responsibilities as counselors that represent the community. Um, th that's just my personal opinion. And Betty? I think it's our responsibility also, and I think I, in response to what Pat said, I think you, he said it doesn't make a difference. If councils, city governments, that. you didn't say that? Well, if city, well, okay, I'll just say, if city governments all over the country do something, it does make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I remember when we passed a resolution opposing the Patriot Act, my, I got a call from friends in South Carolina who just heard about it, and they were thrilled. And we were number 15 in that case, and, and it got a lot of attention that that we had done that. And I think it does make a difference. And I think it's our responsibility. As a governing body, we have more power than we, each of us individually, and I think it's our responsibility to do what we can when it needs to be done. George Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, this this is totally appropriate for the council to do. We do this all the time. We we consider resolutions. We consider renaming structures and highways and all kinds of things that you know. In one respect, you could say, well, the city has no business doing this. Well, that's completely wrong. We do because they're the concerns of our constituents and the citizens that live here. And when enough of them get together and get organized and bring an important matter to us, we it is totally within our purview, and it's very important to consider these. Yes, you could say, you know, well, it's just symbolic. It doesn't really mean anything. Nothing's going to come of it. Symbols are very important, and, and statements of solidarity are, they are important, and they do mean something. And yes, will we see a material benefit in this election cycle? No, of course not. But this will help get the ball rolling and show solidarity with the movement to reform this pernicious influence on our democracy. And I, you know, in that respect, it's very important. Okay. Thank you. Alan? Um, just to clarify, I agree wholeheartedly that unions do not equal corporations. They're not the same thing. They're substantially different. And if, if a resolution in front of us tried to do that, I would say, no, we shouldn't add them together, nor equate them. Uh, but this is about campaign finance reform, as Councilor Ortiz said, and, and about the undue influence, uh, unlimited influence of big money. Um, and it's vastly swamping, corporations swamp unions in terms of expenditures, but, um, and, and, and I think it'll get even worse. So uh, uh, I, 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 that's why I drafted it the way I drafted it. Um, secondly, I understand your point, but I guess where do you draw the line? Um, we take action on state law that's not really pertinent to specific agenda items that the city does all the time uh, in, in IGR, Intergovernmental Relations Committee, and so they're not on the council agenda, but yet we spend a lot of time and effort dealing with all those things because we're a government, and as those things go up the line, they may not be particularly pertinent to uh, exactly our agenda and exactly what we're trying to accomplish and, and getting potholes filled, but they are reflective of, of our government as a totality. And I think all the way up the line, we have a responsibility to deal with those issues, especially when they're a particular import or when we see something that's wrong and needs to be changed, as in this case. 
Um, I wanted to point out one of the sections that was added that I added in here that I think is of particular import to me anyway and kind of encapsulates this whole thing which is uh, in the red line version section E said where money is not speech and therefore regulating political contributions and spending is not equivalent to limiting political speech. And I think that's the essence of, of the, the change that I would like to see in the Supreme Court decision in Citizen United. Rich Pauling. There's a comment quoted earlier about you know, Eugene will be the only city that will have the word unions added to the resolution. Well, good for us. I mean, we're not every other city. Just ask Drix. We are Eugene. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of proud that we've we got that. <laughs> That's the test. Okay, uh, the Drix uh, test. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, um, <laughs> back, back to my other comments. He didn't say uh, my good friend, Drix. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a little concerned about this resolution because there's no – discussion about the monetary amount that this unlimited spending is going to reach and supposedly it's uh, going to be addressed when the proposed constitutional amendment is, is written up. But who's writing up the proposed constitutional amendment? All these people that were elected to office with unlimited spending. So, I mean, I've got some concerns about what the final product is going to look like. And then after, if and when it ever happens, and it's got to go out to the vote of, of the, the citizens to get it passed. So I'm, I'm concerned. I, I don't know how that would, will come out. It's, it's, we'll just have to wait and see. And if we're really, truly concerned about the amount of spending in, in campaigns as a community, why don't we address it on a local level? Why don't we address the, the spending that we, we have? Because as it is now, somebody with limited funds is at a very big disadvantage to run for an elected office here locally. So let's take this one on a local level. Let's discuss spending limits for local elections. And we can start with Eugene. And if Lane County doesn't want to do it, that's fine. But you have a motion. I think that's where the true, if you're going to change the, the, the spending on campaign contributions, I think that's where the true start should be is at the local level. So um, I've got Alan and George Brown in the queue, but we're five, ten minutes now past our first, so let's try to wind this down and vote. So Alan and then uh, yes, Pat. I just wanted to uh, make one more comment that uh, uh, we the people wanted to refer this to a vote of the citizens um, and, and, uh, of Eugene, mm -hmm. uh, not the constitutional amendment, but that will happen down the road hopefully. Um, I'm not prepared to do that today. A uh, couple of things about that. One, it, it would be, if we did it as a special election, it would be prohibitively expensive and I wouldn't even come close to supporting that. If we did it as part of a, an, uh, another ballot, uh, the incremental cost would be very modest. Uh, it would be nothing if there was no um, voters pamphlet. There would be several thousand dollars depending on how many pages were added in and I suspect this one would get several. Um, so there is a cost to the city about doing that even if it were on a, a, a on a regular scheduled ballot. Uh, the, the other point is that we missed the opportunity to put this on the May ballot, so it would have to go on to the November ballot, so we have lots of time until July to decide that. There's also an issue of Lane County and how they uh, are doing the, the ballot this time around and, 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 and how there's some issues around that we need to clarify. So at this point in time, I'm not prepared to do anything with that, but we have time if we choose to do that for the uh, November ballot. George? Well, I just wanted to say that I totally agree with, with uh, <coughs> Councilor Cowling. I think that we should take this up at some point in our agenda. It's the, the amount of money that was spent in the last uh, mayoral election, for instance, mm -hmm. was totally out of line with <laughs> every standard of reason and sanity in my view. And so, yeah, I think we ought to take that up, and I'll support any kind of upcoming work session to discuss that. Um, and a call on Pat, but I would just say that you probably want a um, – uh, sort of a legal parameters thing from uh, Glenn about that because there are uh, you have some limitations on the restrictions you can make locally so that's something that you will want an update from here about. Um, so Pat. And any one of us can go to Orstar and see who raises money for which campaigns locally um, and who pays for it. Uh, it's all <laughs> public record. Um, but looking at the time we spent nearly half an hour I, I count at least a dozen staff members in the room right now uh, we spent at least half an hour in the last council meeting we spent time staff time we have 
two copies in front of us that took staff, staff time, uh, staff resources. If staff's only worth one dollar an hour, we probably spend more than a hundred dollars on this. But I think staff's worth more than one dollar. Their time's worth more than one dollar an hour. So I'm concerned about putting this kind of uh, this kind of workload on staff when so many other things are not being done. When we don't have patrols in neighborhoods, for instance, when that's not happening, and we're spending this kind of resource on this kind of issue that really is not a part of the chartered business of this city. Well, on that note, let's vote. All those in favor, please indicate. Six in favor. All those in opposition. One in opposition. It passes. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda. And it's not buttholes. It's the 2011 neighborhood analysis, right? Are we using... Yes. Yes. Okay. Mayor, I'll just turn over to Lorna who can work, work us through this. All right, we'll just wait for the PowerPoint to come up. Um, Don't mind me, so you introduce yourself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, good afternoon. Um, my name is Lorna Formo, and I'm with Neighborhood Services in the City Manager's Office. And I'm going to give you a brief presentation on the new 2011 neighborhood analysis. I was the project lead. However, um, here with me are Sarah Zaleski and Michael Wist um, from PDD Community Development, who are also an inter integral part of the team. If you'll look in your packet, there are two handouts um, that accompany the presentation. The one in color is a sample of a neighborhood chapter um, of the new 2011 neighborhood analysis. And the black and white copy is the old um, two 2000 neighborhood analysis. You can use those to compare uh, what's been improved. Everybody have those? Okay, great. So my presentation is about 15 minutes. Um, I'll go over the purpose and the process of creating the, neighborhood, the new neighborhood analysis, and then I'll give you a document tour through one of the neighborhoods. And if you can please hold questions until the end. Um, we'll have about 30 minutes or whatever you decide for question and answer. So one of the main purposes of creating the new 2011 neighborhood analysis was that the new census, new 2010 census data was released and an update was needed. And neighborhood services saw a lot of room for improvement and we've made a lot of changes. You can compare the two by looking, but you'll also see changes as we walk through the presentation. Um, it's much more usable and user friendly. It's rich in data and analysis and graphics and maps. Another purpose for updating the neighborhood analysis was that neighbor, neighborhood services has invested a lot of time and resources recently providing trainings and tools to encourage neighborhood associations and community groups to engage more broadly in their neighborhoods. We used an earlier draft of this document during an outreach training series we provided this past fall. The training was well attended um, with both neighborhood association and city commission folks. Um, who were really interested in this data and how it could help them improve their neighborhood areas. We also thought you might find this information valuable and that it would help paint a picture or pictures as you work with your constituents and as you make decisions on service delivery priorities. The information can also help support work in the city and community and neighborhoods by, like I said, identifying needs and priorities and allowing for comparison between neighborhoods and also with the city as a whole, can clarify issues or, um, or gather support for issues, can provide data for grants or other applications, and it can also help lay the foundation for further analysis. We've already had requests for the document from a variety of city departments, including rental housing, transportation planning, fire and EMS, rec the recreation division, planning division, and equity and human rights. We've also had early requests from the following neighborhoods, Train Song Neighbors, Santa Clara Community Organization, River Road Community Organization, Harlow Neighbors, Active Bethel Citizens, all the campus area neighborhoods, and Northeast Neighbors, which is one of the new Cal Young neighbors, neighborhoods. And we've had several requests from media as well. Um, I want to walk you briefly, or I want to talk to you briefly about how we made the decisions on improvements to the new neighborhood analysis. It was done collaboratively through a variety of partnerships. 
uh, Neighborhood Services was the lead on the project. It was our idea and we saw a lot of uh, need for improvements. Early on, we worked with the Community Planning Workshop at the University of Oregon. We gathered input on what would make the document more usable, not only to neighborhoods, but also to city staff and community groups. We interviewed 18 different city staff across city departments. We surveyed neighborhood and community le leaders. We had uh, 74 survey responses. And we vetted the document at several events and meetings. So community development staff from PDD, as I mentioned before, were also integral. And neighborhood, neighborhood Services also had a fabulous intern, Menina Newman, who's also here today, um, who put in hundreds of hours on this project. So this collaborative process helped the project team select new data themes and indicators that would help staff and community groups understand a neighborhood area better. The data themes are listed on the left of this slide, and you'll get a glimpse of each of the indicators under each data theme as I take you through a neighborhood chapter. I briefly want to mention the sources for the data in the document. The U.S. Census Bureau, 2010, U.S. Census Bureau, American Community Survey, City of Eugene Police Department, and City of Eugene and Regional GIS data. <coughs> what is the second one? The American Community American Community Survey. What is it? It's the, um, sen it's, it's what happens in between census. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It's sampling. Additional information. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to point out the data themes and sources before I got into the document tour. So now I'm going to walk you through one neighborhood chapter to show you how the data is organized. It's the sample that you have here in color in your packet, the train song neighbors, will be used primarily as the example. A neighborhood chapter exists for each of the 23 neighborhoods in, in Eugene, and there's also a citywide chapter, which is a composite of the 23 neighborhoods. Each chapter has the exact same format, so they can be compared to one another, neighborhood to neighborhood or neighborhood to city. There's also a nice introduction and a thorough appendix um, to help orient readers and for those searching for more detailed details on data. So this, um, on page U3, the page numbers are on the bottom, um, people is the first data theme in the analysis. One of the indicators under people is race and ethnicity. We added the graphs and simple explanations of how race differs from ethnicity, which is a common confusion among people. For example, Hispanic Latino is an ethnicity, not a race and a person of Hispanic Latino ethnicity can belong to any racial category. On the opposing page, U2, uh, uh, the amenities map, we made significant additions, and you can see that in your handout. Uh, we added grocery stores, museums, community and recreation centers, clinics and hospitals, bikeways and off-street pedestrian and bike paths, community gardens, and city-owned public trees. Page U4, age and gender and veterans are indicators under the people data theme. So you can see in this neighborhood, this neighborhood has a fairly high population of veterans at 18%. There are no grocery stores. On page U5, school enrollment and educational attainment are also indicators under the people theme. School enrollment is new or was added since the last analysis. Here you can see this neighborhood it has lots of kids enrolled in grades 1 through 4 and that a high school diploma is the most prominent educational attainment or school completed at 37%, followed by an associate's or bachelor's degree at 20%. We wanted to include disability information under the people data theme. However, it's not available from the census at the block group level, but we did include um, disability data for in the citywide chapter. <coughs> Page U7 starts the homes data theme. One indicator is renter versus home ownership percentages. Another is housing type by renter owner, which is new. Here you see this neighborhood is composed of nearly 75% renters and 43% of those renters live in a housing type three or more units, which is most likely apartment complexes.
page U8, indicators include age of housing and housing and household composition. Age of housing is also a new addition. Just to provide a very simplified definition of household composition, <coughs> non-family is living alone or living with a non-relative, and family is all other. The census definitions are much more lengthy than that, as <coughs> you can see how they're delineated. Um, in this neighborhood, we see that no homes have been built post-1999, and household composition is split almost evenly between family and non-family households. The top two bars on the lower uh, chart are non-family, and the rest are variations of a family household. Page U9 through 10 starts the economic vitality data theme. One indicator in this theme is income. Uh, income was included in previous uh, neighborhood analyses, but we've improved it a whole bunch <laughs> with detailed definitions and maps included. We included three different income maps for each neighborhood uh, per capita shown here and also median household income and median family income which are included in your in your sample in your packet. Explanations for each of these and their nuances are included in the text. I've included per capita incomes maps for two different neighborhoods here, Train Song and Active Bethel Citizens. I wanted to contrast Train Song, which is nice and neat because the entire neighborhood fits into one block group, with Active Bethel <laughs> Citizens, um, which shows a more complex income map in a neighborhood where there were multiple block groups or where block groups overlapped with other neighborhoods. And this is the case in, in many neighborhoods. These maps are helpful in illustrating higher income and lower income areas within a neighborhood. Page U11 of the economic vitality data theme shows <coughs> the cost of housing indicator. This was a really important addition to the analysis. Previous years never had any data that pointed at housing affordability. This indicator gets at housing affordability through housing cost burden which is a standard indica indicator of economic well-being. If someone's paying 30% or more on housing costs, this is considered a housing cost burden. Income is one variable, which is low in this particular neighborhood. Then the other variable is cost of housing measured in either gross monthly rent or monthly owner costs. Even in a neighborhood with some of the most affordable housing, the Trainsong neighborhood, here you see nearly half of renters and owners have a housing cost burden. Page U11 is a poverty indicator under the economic vitality theme. For 2011, the poverty level for an individual was an annual income of 10,890 or less. For a family of four, the poverty level was an annual income of 22,350 or less. Households in poverty are measured as those that experienced at least 12 months of poverty between 2005 and 2009. So using the train song example, this is 28% of all households in this neighborhood. On page U12, the transportation data theme starts. A transportation map was added, which includes major and minor arterials. You can look at that in your handout copy. Major and neighborhood collector streets, local streets, audible pedestrian signals, sidewalk ramps, sidewalks, on-street bike routes, off-street bike ped paths, both paved and soft trails, railroads and stations, EMX and LTD routes, stops and stations. And on page U13, indicators under the transportation data theme include commute to work and commute to work time, which is a new indicator, as well as the transportation map is new. Page U14 through 17, the land use and zoning data theme, um, which are actually the two indicators, land use and zoning. A separate land use map on page U14 and a separate zoning map on page U16 are included. There have been major improvements to this section, the addition of maps for one, and using the percentage of acres instead of the number of, of acres is much more meaningful and user-friendly. You can see that comparison with the old version, in uh, the 2000 version. In this neighborhood, we see 43% of the land use is in railroad, 
and 53% is industrial zoning compared to 25% residential. The last data theme on page U19 is safety. Your draft that you have is missing the graphics. <laughs> but the indicators here are person, property, and behavioral crimes. We provide a six-year trend of EPD crime data, and this is reported crimes. There are lots of nuances to this data, and most questions would be have, to, have to be directed to an EPD crime analyst. Um, in past neighborhood analyses, the crime and safety data was not usable due to insufficient explanation of the data. You can take a peek at it in the black and white old version if you want. It just didn't make sense. This, um, this new presentation of the data is much more usable. Pretty much concludes my presentation. Um, final versions of the new 2011 neighborhood analysis will be available, available by the end of next week. Um, we'll post the documents online for public and staff use. We'll send you all um, a link to the data once it's available on the web as well. <coughs> neighborhood Services is also looking at an update or addendum to the document with American Community Survey data and local data at, at a five-year interval between censees to keep the information as current and usable as possible. We're also working with ISD to try to provide this data in an interactive online format, which would be another phase of this project. Um, so I want to thank you for your time. And now I'm going to open it up for questions and invite Sarah and Michael um, to join me to answer questions. And if you don't get an initial question answered here, feel free to contact me. Thank, thank you. you. Very interesting data, very interesting survey thing. Uh, I've got uh, George Poling and then Chris and then Alan. George. Just a couple of real quick questions. On the um, school enrollment, is that just public schools or is that private schools, charter schools? Yes. All, all schools. All schools. What are, do the kids that are being homeschooled, do they not, are just, they're not included in this? Yeah, the homeschooled children are counted as private school. Okay. All right. And then on the commute to work, I'm sorry, I can't remember which page that was on. It's on page U13. Okay, you've got two graphs. One is type of commute to work and then travel time to work. Is there any way to combine those and try to find out efficiency in commuting to work? In other words, is traveling by... Uh, say the bus, does that take longer than somebody traveling by in a car by themselves? Or is there any way to, to combine that information to come up with that? See if there's an efficiency in how they get there? Sarah was our main, main data analyst, so. Um. Well, they're not directly correlated. Okay. There might be a data source available in the ACS that has that. I'm not aware of one on okay. the top of my head. Well, if there is one out there, I think that'd be kind of a good statistic to know to see exactly the efficiency that, that they're doing. And then on the uh, the crimes, um, you know, it shows a decline over the six-year period. And just comments on that. It's not really a question. I, I'm sure some of that is is uh, the decline is based on the da data-led policing. But I'm also curious to know how much of that decline is lack of reporting of crime because of uh, perceptions. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to think about. Thank you. Chris, you're next. Thank you. Um, an absolute home run. Absolute home run. I think this is just great. In fact, I don't have my copy with me because I already gave it away. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to need more copies um, because it's that valuable. What's nice about it is it, uh, this particular analysis is important because it coincides with the promised neighborhoods mm -hmm. that have been identified. There's one that is this neighborhood and then there's another one in Springfield. So this, use, this information is especially useful for that and can be linked then. Another component that would add dimension to it would be um, information from the school catchment area, um, which is Malabon and Fairview. And those could then be folded into this not just so that it would link with Promise Neighborhood, but so that it could give an even more complete picture of that area, the analysis of the area. Um, because I think knowing the nature of the demographics there is good, but if you can link that to school enrollment, 
um, can then give you an idea of the interconnection between uh, the financial situation there, the educational situation there, and the other factors, and how those are interreacting. And, and, and that information is available. School districts are now collecting a lot more robust information on a school catchment basis that could be folded into this. But um, those are just little nitpicky things <coughs> of, of what's already a tremendous advance over what you had before. And so I'm looking forward to having this done for all of the neighborhoods, and then we will really be um, in an enviable position in terms of the level of understanding we have about our community. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Great it, job. It, it is available. It will be available by the end of next week for all 23 neighborhoods <laughs> in the citywide one. And when we when we look at the next census data, this is all we could do with the resources we yeah. had this time. But we'll definitely go through another process and see what other kinds of data we can do with the resources. It's that great. Have. It's just wonderful. It would be really uh, neat as we. Um, as you said when you began, as we sort of analyze what we're going to do and where we aim things to be able to use this information to try to um, move the dial uh, in places where we need it the most. So it would be, be very, very interesting. Alan. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's just a home run. I think it's a grand slam. This is one of the, <laughs> this is one of the best documents I've seen come out of the city in on years. So. Um, Great, great work. It's, I think it's going to be, uh, it's the right info. It's easy to read. It's accessible. Uh, it's easy to use. I can see, as the mayor was talking about, this ver being very useful for communities to take a good snapshot of where they are and, and, and uh, identifies what they're doing well and what they need to work on. Mm -hmm. um, so in that, in, in that sense, I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, and, you know, the graphics, the maps, the, the charts and the text all just works together really well it's it's pretty uh, and and um, and understand these are available for every all of them all the neighborhoods, all neighborhoods plus a citywide which is a composite of all the 23 neighborhoods That'd be really good to which see. isn't the same as getting on the census website and pulling up Eugene City we actually took which I've all done, of the 23 don't neighborhoods do and put them together so that you can compare apples to apples that's great yeah, yeah. great how did how did that work did um, because our neighborhoods don't necessarily track census track, do they? No, not all of them do. We had to go through a process um, where we sat down and looked at. Um, can we look you at wanna, the block? Sarah yeah. can explain it the best. We look at the block groups. The tracks don't align oh. at all with the neighborhoods for the most part. Yeah. So we looked at the block groups and determined which block groups we thought would best be suited to each neighborhood. The blocks, which is a lower geography than the block groups, was much easier. And that's where the census is. Is a block a block? Literally? Not all the time. But it's about that level of Sometimes, granularity. Sometimes. Yes, bigger. it really depends on what geographic and other features it's determined by. As you go higher in the geographies, it's based on other things. Cool. Good. Hey, Pat. Thank you. There's not much that I can say that's not already been said. This really is tremendous. I, I lay awake at night reading things like this. <laughs> I did last night. <laughs> and this is some of the and you thought yesterday was Valentine's Day. No, I think that uh, just to tag along with what Councillor Pryor said, you know, 37.5% uh, of the City Council is a former school board member. So uh, uh, yeah. we we have, you know in the past paid pretty close attention to school collection areas, and that's some of, that's been some of the the best, for instance, poverty information that you can get is uh, what what is the free and reduced rate uh, lunch programs uh, for the uh, for the different uh, different school areas, and I think that uh, you know this takes it several steps further than that. But it would be interesting to ask if you did overlay that or to at some point overlay what Fairfield and Malibon look like com and how, the, how, how it overlays with the data that you provided. This is much more in-depth. I mean, this is, this is the kind of stuff that really is fascinating right down to the very last word. So uh, very well done. And I think coordinating with school districts and, uh, and uh, making certain that we are serving the people who need to be served at the greatest level that we, that we can possibly serve them. That's what mm -hmm. this is all about. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. George Brown. Thank you. Yeah, this this is really neat. I um so we, they're going to be um every neighborhood will be analyzed like they're this already they're, they're already, already happen, done. They will I be, just it will be yeah. available online and the the neat thing I mean and that's a great document. I um 
So I imagine if we want copies of it all, we just have to print them out ourselves, right? I, but I, to me, as a, as, a, as a map lover, one of one of the great features, besides all the great data and analysis, is are the color uh, color portions. Um, we, that's we, a big plus right. for me. And I, the PDF, I'll put I'm just wondering here. if my printer at home can handle it. But I, I'll find out. We tried to we tried to um, make them so that they could be printed black and white to be more accessible as much yeah. as possible, but some like the zoning and land use maps, they just sure, are not sure. readable in without yeah. color. And right. like I said, we will, at the end of next week, as soon as they're up on the web, we'll send you all a link okay. to them and you can look at your particular neighborhoods that you're interested in. Yeah, great, I wanna look at all of them. Mm -hmm. and, and this is great analysis. Mm -hmm. I just have a question, you may not even know the answer. I'm, I'm just wondering if the new word maps have been completed. Do we pick those up at Lane elections and word have the new word well the word boundary word maps, word maps word with the precincts redistricting with the new precinct boundaries and stuff? Have you, have you heard if they're ready yet? Kelly says yes. Kelly says yes. yes <laughs> they are. <laughs> they're on the web. They're on the web. Kelly says okay. they're on the web. <laughs> you can print your own, George. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm going to want one of the wall ones. <laughs> the wall ones. Nifty wall ones that you can get at Lane elections. Those are yeah. pretty cute. Cool. Yeah. The rocks and blowing it up. Andrea. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mayor. Well, it's nice to see you, there. Lorna. Um, thank you for doing this. I don't have anything to say that hasn't already been said. I look forward to the other chapters of the other neighborhoods. I think it's it's a very good snapshot of of demographics that um, definitely can be shared with other agencies. Good work to you and your team. Betty. Just a question. Will there be books like this for the other neighborhoods? Yes, we'll have it. In the exact. It's a chapter. A chapter for each neighborhood. They're already done. They're they're just getting finalized but next week and then something be like this not just on the web something like this um, can we get a binder all of all of them we have a, we're going to put a hard copy there of the, we go. Full, the full document is it's quite a document put all 23 together in the, the Tennessee's and the city data and um and it's quite expensive to copy all that mm -hmm. color so we've made a, a decision to put a hard copy at the library we're going to put a hard copy uh, here at City Hall, too, which will be accessible to all of you. Uh, distributing to all the neighborhoods, um, both the links for online versions, but we're also going to give everybody a CD so they have an accessible a CD the whole There you go. The CD oh, would be good. I, I hear a request for CDs. But, uh, will there be a book like this for each neighborhood? The, the, they're not a physical not book. book. We're going to have in, in at City Hall and at the library, we'll have... I mean. People can George have them print printed up <laughs> if <laughs> they <laughs> want. Well, I wonder why you there, chose there, this one and why over others, and why couldn't well, everyone have one? Well, it's still in draft. It's still slightly in draft form. We um, chose one neighborhood it's to do, neighborhood do, do the presentation and go through um, what's there. So we just selected a neighborhood to go through for the presentation. Oh, you're kidding me. You've it, all this other? information is available for each of the 23 neighborhoods. Come over to the other side of the, At the same I guess time the point week. that you've been trying to make, I believe, is that it's expensive to print these out in number for everybody. About $200. And so you're each? you're trying to make these you're trying to make these available in a way that most people can access them. <coughs> and I and then for those who don't use electronic means you're trying to make them physically available at sites where people may access them easily to go look at them right yes we'll also have a copy in neighborhood services so neighborhood services the library and city hall um, and CDs and CDs um, yeah they're about 180 to 200 dollars to print in color they're about five over 500 pages with the appendix and also mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, and uh, obviously we all appreciate the work a great deal. Okay. We're going to transition now into the um, building inspector field mobility. Who gets to do that? This is five. We'll see. <laughs> City manager. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. I'll just turn over to Stuart Ramsing, and he'll. Take Welcome us wherever Stuart. we need to go. All right. Thank you. Um, Kyle Richardson supervises our inspectors, and he's seen if he can get a little slideshow up and running. The slideshow isn't actually for you. It's uh, to leave running while we invite you down to the garage to actually show you the real vehicle. But um, Ooh, how are we do that? <laughs> just yeah. Uh, so um, it's, it's just we have this opportunity. It's seldom we get to talk about building inspection in the in the uh, context of we're transforming some of the way we do our business, and it's exciting. So we wanted to share that we had this opportunity here. Um, 
the building inspectors, uh, I think the, the, the stories are out there on the street about their role is and the way they work with the community. They, when they do their job really masterfully, it actually goes unnoticed for the most part. The builders have the relationship with them, but we don't. And we take for granted when we're in the spaces like this, the exit doors are going to work and, the, and the, there's some degree of protection between the garage below us and, and uh, <laughs> the meeting room that we're in here and all. And um, so we're, our, our role then is, uh, Kyle and I, to support the inspectors in doing their best work. And uh, traditionally, they've had an office environment like uh, we've all come to know and love, where they come to work, park their cars, come to work, um, come to their office, get uh, a uh, their assignment for the work of the day. And uh, Kyle, if you want to sit over here, you have a mic. Sure. Um, they get their assigned work for the day, and then they head out into the field, and that's where they work with the builders. So, what we have here, and all. Um, pause and go through that, I guess. Um, we're moving the inspectors closer to their real work in the field. That's what it's all about. So let me turn it over to Kyle here. Kyle is our inspection supervisor who is responsible for bringing much of this to the, to the inspectors. Welcome, Kyle. Good afternoon. Um, we began what we refer to as field mobility about five years ago. And initially, at, at that time, our, our vehicles were the Toyota Prius. And we essentially tried to stick all of our computers and code books and everything into that car. And what we found was we ended up with a front seat that was our office space, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> this included laptops, uh, digital cameras, cell phones, uh, multifunction device for color printing, scanning, and, and, and uh, copies. Um, it was a huge hit with the contractors and the homeowners. Um, it enabled them to have their inspection results and data instantly. Um, through a broadband connection, the inspectors are able to use all the applications that they would use in the office while in the field. Um, we encountered problems with trying to fit all that into a Prius. It was difficult uh, for the inspectors getting in and out of a, a small vehicle 30, 40 times a day and the ergonomics of using essentially the front seat as their office. Uh, so as the Priuses have come to the end of their life cycle and our computers have come to the end of their useful life cycle, we've implemented what we're referring to as version 2. And to that end, um, we are in the process of purchasing a small Ford minivan referred to as the Ford Transit Connect. You're probably seeing more of them around town now with some other contractors and stuff. There's one right there. Um, this afforded us a lot more room. Um, what we've done is we've taken the back end of that, it's essentially an empty cargo van, and have converted it into a, a mobile office space. So it has a desk and a comfortable seat, um, lots of storage space, all the computer equipment is set up and hardwired back there. Um, we're switching from a laptop to a tablet so the inspectors can actually carry the hardware into the work site with them, actually do their correction memos and data right there. It enables us to be in a building with a builder now and open up the approved set of plans and make changes right there, review any questions they might have. It's just we're finding it provides uh, an, an amount of customer service that we've not been able to do before. So the feedback I'm getting from the community and the builders has been tremendous. Great. Hmm. Is there an interest then to go down to see the actual vehicle? We have it down in the basement. Uh, or below the parking garage. So what I would offer is that we can walk down there, take a quick look at it. Um, if, if uh, to the extent we can hold any questions, we can come back up here where we can better uh, share the questions and the feedback, and uh, then you can conclude your meeting if that That's suits cool. you. Are we okay with that in terms of the? So, uh, what will the TE guys? This will just be This is on a loop. Yes, we've talked to them, and so uh, Kyle has a slideshow. This will be running while we're gone and um, it, it gives a little bit of the story. And there will be some silence for anyone that dials up right now. That's another reason to hold the questions. It's kind of exciting when you see it, or it is from our perspective, but if we take it in, experience it, then we'll come back up and finish the discussion. Let's just loop the last conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we have cardboard cutouts that we put in your places while we're down there. Hey, Benny, why don't you and I stay and just do Shakespeare? <laughs> I'll have to say, John, enough of this outside the box. Brush up your shakes. Yeah, okay. We'll stay in the box. Now. Now on. <laughs> you do the same play as I do. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> do that in the middle of all our meetings. With the temperature, it's at least invigorating. Yeah, uh -huh. that's true. Yeah, that's a word. So my question is, uh, are we the, are other communities around us doing the same kind of thing, or are we fairly unique at, at this mobile? It's only anecdotal right now. We believe not. We just, this is a prototype. This is our first one. Mm -hmm. We're measuring it and learning from it. I just shared it with a group of building officials that met two weeks ago over in Springfield, mm -hmm. and they had the same reaction you did. It, it, it's, uh, on some levels, it's so basic. Why is this not being done? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is RV conversion kind of stuff. We've been doing that for years. Why not for the work vehicle? And so we're not hearing stories of it, although I'd be surprised. Assume it'll come, yeah. As soon as I see it, it'll catch on. Yes, Alan. So what do the builders think about it? The builders are excited about it. Um, it does a couple things. One, it gives a place to meet because every job site is different, unique. Some job sites, frankly, aren't very conducive to to dialogue and conversation. Yeah. And um, there's there's some subtle things coming up. The uh, frankly, the inspectors don't like coming up to a job site in a Prius. That's uh, it like flames painted on the side, that may help some. <laughs> but uh, it does give an area that has a very professional um, look to it, a presentation, which we like. We want to present to a job site that well. And it gives a place now where they can come together. And now we have access to the uh, plans increasingly online. In fact, that's another effort we're doing in the city is our plans will all be yeah. digital. A year from now, we'll probably be doing that. So they can actually work on the, the issues that really need to be worked about around instead of trying to dodge the raindrops and some of that great. silliness now. So they, they have embraced it. Mm -hmm. and, and what about, so does this mean that the inspectors don't have to have a physical office space? Kyle? Well, uh, we're talking about that very seriously. Uh, we're looking at the potential elimination of our current office space and creating some smaller space that has, for lack of a better term, a meeting room with a place to connect your tablet, log in. Um, we're thinking maybe some comfortable chairs and some exercise equipment there and <laughs> allow them to have a meeting place every morning before they head out to the field. Mm -hmm. We're convinced that it's important for field staff to have a, a come together every oh, yeah. day and, mm -hmm. and have access to the rest of the staff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, common space. Yeah. Yeah. it's presenting an issue we haven't dealt with before. Technologically, we do not need the office anymore. Now there's the issue of how do you work around the culture, the things we take for granted since we've always had the meeting, and we have to manage that. And we haven't crossed that bridge yet, but we have the ability, and we're 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 moving in that direction. Need to remember what each other looks like. Absolutely. Right. Be when I was at Electric Utility, uh, the foreman basically, when we got mobile laptops, their office became their trucks, and they they had a physical space where you know their crew drop off their time cards, but um, all that eventually got electro electronic anyway in, in a, this is very much an analogy because you almost all the time out in the field. Yep. I'd be curious about, um, see. it's fine with me if it's just a trade-off, but I'm just curious about whether it saves you money in any way in terms of uh, your, your job. Yeah. Uh, in fact, with the uh, first version of field mobility with the Prius, um, we were expecting some productivity gains um, from having the inspectors out in the field a little more. Um, because they'd have to come back to the office to do all their data entry. What we weren't expecting was that we picked up an extra hour per inspector per day. Wow. Which was substantial and, and added up at the time to up, almost yeah. two and a half employees per year in terms of labor savings. Um, it, additionally, um, the cost of the Ford Transit Connect is considerably less than the previous vehicle. What you saw down there today which is a prototype, which is a little more expensive to build than the production versions. As you saw it with all the computer gear, monitors, and everything, fully loaded is less than the cost of a, a Prius off the lot. Wow. What's the gas mileage? Um, it's comparable. They're saying uh, 25 in the city, and we were experiencing you know, roughly 35 to 42 with the Good. Prius. My calculations show that we're going to spend about a dollar ten more a day per vehicle in fuel costs. But you're getting so much more yes. out of it. Dollar ten point what? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, that's all interesting. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody? No. Oh, good work. Very innovative. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, we enjoyed that. That was good. This was our, our good news day, so is that right? Be the way the future city manager that we'll all just be in cars and just be going from. 
cops are kind of that way. Yeah, you know, I think so. The more uh, that you can actually get into the field, you don't need the fixed cost of the oh. physical structure. Although I think what Stuart brings up is an interesting piece around Some culture. Common areas. And what does that mean for work and how we define work mm -hmm. and the social aspects of work? So I think as we continue into the future, more and more of these kinds of things will mm -hmm. roll themselves out. But I thought the point was well taken that having a place where people can actually come together and it may not be the, the, the office units that you're accustomed to, but you do probably need a place where, where you actually get to talk with each other and share your experiences and learn from each other and all of those kinds of things. So. Yeah. And when they meet, they'll go back to the future with the circle of wagons and <laughs> circle all the bands together. Right, <laughs> back right. to the future. Around, around the campfire. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all very much. We appreciate much. it. Good job. And with that, I guess we'll end the meeting, right? All right. I was worried about time, and here we are early. Great. Nice job. Um,